Money integrates our entire modern civilization. We earn it, we spend it, and we are all connected by it. But have you ever asked, what is money? Through my work with tech and energy, I started asking this question and discovered that our concept of money has evolved throughout history and is evolving as we speak today. We first started using money about 5,000 years ago. Before that, we bartered by trading goods and services. However, trading cows isn't very efficient, so we developed currencies that were more easily traded, such as salt. Hence the phrase, worth his salt, and the root of the word, salary. Over time, we migrated from salt to gold, because gold is better money than salt. What makes something better money than another? A money is better if it is more durable, more portable, more divisible, and more scarce. There's an economic principle called Thiers' law, which states that good money drives out bad. And as such, we've always migrated to better money throughout history. We've migrated from cows to seashells, from seashells to salt, and from salt to gold. Gold persisted as one of the best forms of money humans have had through the modern times. Breckenridge was founded during the gold rush of 1859. Prospectors made their way out to this mountain town, and with little more than a pick, shovel, and pan, riches were discovered and Breckenridge became famous. This was one of Colorado's greatest gold mining towns, producing over one million troy ounces of gold. That's roughly the weight of four semi-trucks. Money serves three primary functions. A store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. When a new money emerges, it adopts these three properties sequentially. Once the money proves itself as a store of value because it doesn't deteriorate and isn't easily counterfeited, then people can start using it as a medium of exchange. Once enough people use it as a medium of exchange, it becomes a unit of account, similar to how the US dollar is a unit of account for oil. Ultimately, money is a tool that humans use to trade time with one another. When we exchange dollars, we're really exchanging representations of hours that we worked for those dollars. So if time is money and money is time, then money that takes no time to create is not sound money. Since it takes time to extract gold, gold serves as an effective monetary tool to represent time. However, because gold is physical and heavy, it lacks portability, which limits its use as a medium of exchange. By issuing currencies redeemable for gold, banks figured out a way to improve gold's portability across space. The problem with gold-backed currencies is that they require trust. They require trust in banks, not to issue currencies in excess of their gold reserves, and they also require trust in banks to maintain the gold peg so that they do not compromise the scarcity of money. The US held a gold-backed standard until 1971, when President Nixon announced that the US would no longer convert dollars to gold. Every time a nation has depegged from a physical standard, their paper notes have lost value because the urge to print more money at no cost is irresistible. This leads to wealth inequality and destruction of the purchasing power over time. Part of the reason we are experiencing soaring inflation today is because over 30% of all the US dollars in existence were created in just the past three years. 
When we first created the US dollar, it was in an era before the internet. So, if we were to develop money from first principles today, what would that look like? It would be scarce like gold, portable like currencies, but not corruptible by any singular entity. It would look like Bitcoin. Bitcoin was developed in 2008 as a response to the banks being bailed out of the financial crisis. It was believed that as church and state are separated, it is also important for money and state to be separated. To quote Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous inventor of Bitcoin, central banks must be trusted not to debase the currency. However, the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Beyond trusting banks not to debase the currency, there are other challenges with our banking system. If you wanted to send money to a friend or relative overseas, you couldn't do that right now on a Sunday at about 2.30 p.m. You'd have to wait for the banks to open and hope that it isn't a banking holiday. It would take two or more business days to settle. And all of this is possible only if you and the recipient are part of the banking system and all the intermediary banks permit that fund transfer. While everybody here likely has the privilege of banking, there are over one billion people globally who are unbanked. Bitcoin allows anyone to transfer value anywhere in the world 24 seven with just an internet connection. Even Ukraine was able to accept donations in Bitcoin to fund defense and evacuation efforts during the war while all the banks were shut down. Prior to central banks, money could not be weaponized. Gold doesn't require anybody's permission to exchange it and could be used by friends or foe. Money is increasingly becoming weaponized, leading to political censorship across the world. Canada has frozen bank funds without court order, and you can no longer send money to your niece in Russia, despite the fact she is vehemently against the war. If money can be used by those you love against those you hate, then when the political winds change, money can be used by those you hate against those you love. This underscores the need for a truly neutral money. Just like gold, Bitcoin has no CEO and no central governing organization. And this is a key difference between Bitcoin and most other cryptocurrencies, which have founding teams with various business use cases. Bitcoin was built with just one objective, to be the world's best money. Anybody can become their own bank and participate in the Bitcoin network by downloading the open source software. You may have heard of Bitcoin mining, which simulates the activity of gold mining by tying in time and energy to the creation of new units of currency. Bitcoin miners gravitate towards cheap, stranded, and wasted forms of energy. And this is leading to the development of renewable energy farms and stabilizing grids. And it's happening right now in states such as Texas and countries such as El Salvador. Last year, I visited El Salvador to examine for myself at ground level the adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender. While it wasn't without its challenges, I paid for meals, transportation, and accommodation, all with Bitcoin. Even McDonald's, although I don't really eat much McDonald's, <laughs> accepted Bitcoin. El Salvador doesn't have its own currency and instead relies on the US dollar. There are several dollar-denominated countries around the world 
but they don't benefit from the bank bailouts, PPP loans, and stimulus checks that we receive here. Instead, they simply see the purchasing power of their dollar eroding over time. We're comfortable here in the US, never having seen the horrors of monetary colonialism, misogynist financial policy, frozen bank accounts, or an inability to connect and integrate with the global economy. In a globally connected world, where trust is uncertain and the banking system was built in a bygone era, it's worthwhile to examine how can money evolve from being controlled by a few people behind closed doors to an open monetary network accessible by all? Bitcoin provides an escape hatch for any country or any person wanting to opt in to a neutral, sound monetary system. Bitcoin provides a reimagination of commodity money in modern times with the added power of the internet and distributed computing. So the next time you use money, consider that one day it just might be Bitcoin. Thank you. <laughs>